good morning. My name's Ben, and uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I look forward to doing that. Uh, I love coffee, so I hang out in the cafe. Love to shake your hand, put a face with a name, so uh, please come introduce yourself to me. Um, I love being here with Colonial, so um, if you're a guest here, welcome. Uh, I'm one of the pastors on our staff team, and uh, took three planes to get here yesterday from Columbia, South Carolina, but I uh, love doing that every weekend to hang out with you guys. Today we're starting a new series called Your Move, and uh, I, I'm so excited about this series, and so, I, okay, I got to be honest. You're going to want to walk out when I say what I'm about to say, but I'm going to ask you not to. Like, I need you to stay in your seat and hear me out, okay? So don't get up and leave when I say this. You're a bit of a mess, right? <laughs> like, come on, let's be honest. You are, right? Like, you, you're a bit of a mess. I am too. I'm, I'm a mess too. Like, uh, just in case you don't get the wrong impression, the, the guys who are up here on the stage leading every weekend and our elders and our staff, we're a mess. Like, we are a messed up group of people. We're not perfect. So if, if that's your impression, you are way off, okay? We aspire to be awesome, but we're just as messed up as you are, okay? So the people who are steering and navigating this ship is a bunch of messed up folks, okay? So if you resonate with that, you're in the right place. Like, welcome. We are. We're messed up. And you, you, you get it honest, right? Mama and Daddy made decisions that created the context whereby you became who you are, and their mama and daddy were messed up too, and it's just a messed up life. Like, welcome to the human race. And so every day, you make decisions because of who you are, and the decisions you make today, you make them because you made decisions yesterday and the day before that, and somebody 20 years ago made decisions, and that's what brought you into the world, or 50 or 80 or whatever, you know, it is. like, by the way, children are impulse disorders. You realize that, right? Like, I have three kids, they're all impulse disorders, and they run around my house making a muck of things, right? So we, the context in which we live makes us who we are, and the decisions that we make are the result of that context. And I got bad news for you. It's all your fault. You can't blame mama for leaving, you know, dad couldn't put the bottle down, and so mama decided to split, and you can't blame her. Like, that created the context that made you you, but it's, it's your decision. Like, it was your fault. Okay, like, maybe your story goes the other way, and dad was actually able to kick the habit, and so you've got a completely different story, and you're here today, and you still make dumb decisions, right? Like, I don't know what your background is, where you came from, what you did yesterday before you thought about coming today. Like, we're just, we're messed up, and we need help. But if you're really honest, you can't be trusted. Neither can I. I mean, I've got a track record. Let's test this out. You ready? How many of you today have a car or a couch that you should not have purchased? Raise your hand. Show me. You got a car, right? Right? Dumb purchases. We don't need to really go any further than that. You blame the dealer because the sales guy sold you the car and you didn't really want it. It's like, no, wasn't the, wasn't the salesman's fault. You talked yourself into those monthly payments. That was all you, big boy. Like, it's you. The couch. Like, who in the right mind buys new couches until the kids are grown and out of the house? Like, it's just, you, you did that. How, how many of you have stepped into a doomed relationship? right? Mama tried to tell you not to. Your best friend was trying to tell you not to. And you're like, but she's awesome. And she's so much fun to hang out with. She gets me. Like, I, I need to do this. Or he, I know he still lives in the basement at his parents' house. And I know he doesn't have a job, but he's a really great guy. Like, we rationalize ourselves into these things, don't you? Don't we? How many of you years ago, you started a destructive habit. And if you could go back and tell your former self about all the regret and havoc that it was going to create in the future, you, you would talk yourself out of it. You had no idea that consuming that substance or going to that place or hanging out with that group of people would result in the mess of a life that you have right now. And if you could do anything, you'd go back and you would not make that dumb purchase. You would not step into that doomed relationship. You wouldn't start that destructive habit right? But you did. And the question that we want to kind of wrestle with over the next six weeks is, how do we make decisions 
in this mess that we call life in a way that leads to better circumstances and not to worse. Because I guarantee you, you might disagree with almost everything I say today, but you're not going to leave here and want a less stable life. Everybody's going to leave and say, how do I make decisions in a way that sets me up to succeed in the future, especially in the areas where I haven't succeeded up until now? It's true of all of us. Here's the bottom line. Your heavenly Father has made decisions about you, and now it's your move. It's your time. It's your choice. It's your decision. But if I'm honest, I can't be trusted, and neither can you. So how in the world do we make better decisions than the ones that we've made? I need accountability. It's probably one of the greatest reasons I got married. Like, I need somebody to look at the bank account every week and say, you're using the plastic a little too much at Starbucks, okay? Like, I need that accountability. And I just say back to her, fine. It's not an addiction. <laughs> like, it could be worse. It could be addicted to the stuff. Like, I need that accountability. I need people in my life who can speak wisdom into my life. But we're in a catch-22, aren't we? Like, I can't be trusted with my own decisions. You can't be trusted with your decisions. How in the world are we going to collectively make better decisions about my life? Right? If none of us are trustworthy, where in the world do we turn for something that can be trusted to help us make better decisions? This is one of the reasons why I carry my Bible. Like, at the end of the day, I can't trust you to help me make the right decision. I can't even trust me to make the right decision. The only thing that I have that I can trust is God's Word. And it's why I encourage you to bring your Bible with you. Like, bring it, open it up. Study it, read it, take it in. And we're going to do that together for a couple of weeks. So I decided that we would do something creative. So um, most of us carry around these thousand-page books that are really random and odd and intimidating. Anybody not read the Bible because it's thick and overwhelming, right? Like, that's me some days. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. So what I did, I took Paul's letter to Titus, which is what we're going to study for the next six weeks, and we printed it out on 8 half by 11 paper trifolded it and put it in an envelope. You're going to get one of these on the way out the door. It literally is my gift to you, and it's nothing more than the text of Paul's letter to Titus. It takes up the front and back of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It's pretty fantastic. You can read this in its entirety in 12 minutes, and I'm a slow reader. My challenge to you for the next six weeks, fold this up, Put it in your purse, stick it in your back pocket, leave it in your car, put it in your cubicle. I don't really know what that looks like for you, but read it once a week. I just want you to read it once a week. How's that for a reading plan? Don't carry your whole Bible to work with you, just carry this. Now, I changed a couple of words so it flows a little bit more like a North American first century letter. But how cool is this? You can take this to your break room at work and sit and read it while you eat lunch. And uh, your coworkers will come and they'll be like, what are you reading? You're like, it's a letter. Oh, cool. Where'd you get it? Yeah, it's at, you're going to sound really smart to these coworkers. You're going to say, it's actually an ancient document from the first century from a guy named Paul to another guy named Titus. It's pretty sweet. And they're going to be like, whoa. I had no idea you were that smart. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> like, could you imagine? You'd be getting into conversations about Jesus at the lunch table accidentally. It's pretty cool. How would this change your life? If you read this every week, maybe some of you are like, that's underachieving. I can do 10 minutes, 12 minutes every day. Like, hey, have at it. Read it once a day for the time that we're going to spend in Paul's letter to Titus. How would your life change if you read this once a day or once a week for the next six weeks? It would be incredible because this letter, I love studying this letter to Titus because this letter gets incredibly practical. Paul's going to tell Titus about how to lead families with God's gospel. He's going to tell Titus how to lead organizations with the gospel. He's going to tell him how to lead churches with the gospel. He's going to tell you how to run your company, how to parent your kids, how to relate to your spouse or your partner. There's incredibly practical stuff in this letter. Could you imagine how your family, how your household, how your job could be better in the coming weeks just because you decided to saturate your mind and your heart with this content. Can I challenge you? When they hand it to you on the way out the door, 
put it somewhere that you go everywhere with and let it saturate your mind. Now, this letter, um, I got to tell you, you might think that our culture is messed up. Um, Titus is on Crete. Anybody's grandmama ever call somebody a Cretan? You ever hear somebody use that word? This is where it started. Okay, like in the text, in chapter one, Paul actually quotes one of their own people and says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That was the island of Crete. Hey, Titus, I want you to go lead the church there. Oh, okay. The island was occupied by mercenaries. Literally, this is the island where former Roman soldiers would go to retire, and in their retirement, they would go kill people for freelance money. Like that's the audience that Titus is working with. And while they're off killing people for extra money, their wives are at home sleeping around with everybody. It's Jersey Shore, people. Like, that's what we're reading about here. And so if you think that God's Word is not relevant, I'm going to show you over the next six weeks, this is incredibly relevant to life. What does it look like to take the next right move in my relationship with God? Does it make any difference about how I live? And I say, it does, but you're untrustworthy. So we need something that can be trusted. And I love that Paul, in this letter, chapter 3, verse 8, here's what he tells Titus. He says, listen, this saying is trustworthy. This saying is trustworthy. Now, if we took this phrase and translated it literally, word for word, in the original language, it means the word is trustworthy, or the message is is trustworthy, or this logic is trustworthy, is literally what the phrase says. So you've got to ask the question, what word, what message, what logic is trustworthy? And what comes immediately before this in the letter, for two and a half paragraphs, Paul has been rehearsing the gospel, the good news of Jesus for Titus. And here's what he says, the grace of God appeared And it wasn't in wrath and anger and condemnation. The grace of God appeared in goodness and loving kindness, bringing rescue for all men who would trust in the finished work of Jesus. This logic is trustworthy. I think what he's saying to Titus is, listen, at the end of the day, the gospel can be trusted. The gospel is trustworthy. You can build your life on it. You can take it to the bank. You can put stock in it. And so I want you to insist on these things, Titus. In the work that you're doing on Crete, I want you to trust the gospel and insist on it. Why? Hopefully you're reading along in your Bible right now. I'm going to throw you a curveball. I want you to insist on the gospel so that those who've believed in God might be absolutely certain of where they're going when they die. Is that what your Bible says? You do realize I can put anything on this screen I want to, right? I write this stuff for our team. That's not in the Bible. That's how we think, though, isn't it? Like, this is how we start the conversation. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where you'd go? Do you realize that question is almost irrelevant? That in the end, where we're going is actually more about who we're with? The better question is, if Jesus were to come back right now, would he know you? That's the better question. Or would he look at you and say, hmm, I've never met you. You're not coming home with me. It's a big deal. This is nowhere in the Bible, by the way. Now, how about this one? Um, So that those who believed in God might feel more satisfied with their spirituality by sitting under lots and lots of Bible teaching. (laughs) Titus, I want you to insist on the gospel so that all these Christians can be satisfied that they have thoroughly learned the Bible. Nowhere in the New Testament is that idea present. It's not in your Bible. How about this one? So that those who believed in God might live lives that are perfect because they've kept all the rules. Titus, I want you to insist on the gospel because if people would just obey it, their lives would be awesome. and They'd be perfect, right? This is our practical theology, isn't it? Oh, you drink alcohol, you got to stop that. Oh, you sleep around with your friends and neighbors, you got to knock that off. Oh, you spend all your money on lottery tickets and then whine about how you don't have enough to make ends meet at the end of the month. Stop it. Or how about this one? 
Oh, you don't get up in the morning and spend 15 minutes to 30 or an hour with your Heavenly Father in a devotional. You've got to start that. Because until you have that, then you, you don't really have a relationship with Jesus. This is how we think, isn't it? Come on, I grew up in the Bible Belt. I know how this works. If we would just stop, stop, start, and quit, we'd be, we'd be fine. So Titus, I want you to insist on the gospel in all the churches on Crete, because if people could just follow the rules, then the gospel will be on display. It's not anywhere in the Bible. Watch what he says. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Now, what I expect to read. You want me to insist on the gospel so that those who are listening can devote themselves to living a godly life in the community. You want me to insist on the gospel so that those who have believed in God can devote themselves to good works. I thought we were saved by faith in Jesus, not by works. Yes, absolutely true. Don't for a second think that what Paul's saying is that your good works change your heavenly father's mind about you at all. By the way, he's infatuated with you. And what he wants is for you to live out that love. The word careful here, you can translate it intentional. I want, I want you to insist on the gospel so that those who are trying to live out the gospel can, in a calculated manner, be thoughtful about putting it into practice, devoted to good works. Why? He explains because these things, I want you to insist on these things. Why? Because these things are excellent and profitable for people. Ben, how do I live a life that's progressively getting better? How do I make decisions so that life ends up being better and not less stable? It's about putting the gospel to work in your life. What if some of you... You love your job, you love what you do, you even love the company and the employer who hired you to do it. And yet, you have a friend a couple states over, and they called a couple weeks ago, and they're saying, hey, we're going to start this new thing, and we'd love for you to come and be a part of this new thing with us. And you're struggling to make that decision. Like, how do, how, what's the next right move in this decision? I don't know. Could you stop first and ask, Heavenly Father... Where would you have me be vocationally and locationally to make the greatest impact for your kingdom? That's the gospel being applied to your decision making. You've got to make a move whether you leave or stay. Is, it's irrelevant almost. But what would the gospel have me do? Some of you, you're trying to figure out, do you go back to school? Do you finish that degree? You, maybe you just graduated and you're thinking about doing another one and I don't know what the right move is. Have you asked him? Father, what would you have me do with my education and my vocational goals to make the greatest impact in my life on this community? How can I be leveraged by you for your gospel? Maybe you're struggling with a kid. Uh, my... my my kid, uh, my five-year-old, uh, the other day I heard him walking into his room and he goes, Mom's stupid. I was like, okay, we're going to solve that right now. I heard that. Turn around. <laughs> right? Like, how do I parent my kids with the gospel in view? How do I bring God's discipline into my family in a way that my kids don't fear me and my wife doesn't hate me? What does that look like? I got to know what my heavenly Father's heart is and what he would want me to do if I'm going to faithfully Apply the gospel, and it leads to a profitable and more excellent life. It's a challenge, isn't it? Here's what I think Paul's ultimately saying. Gospel truth produces gospel living. This is the message of Titus, I think, what Paul's trying to say to Titus. Listen, Titus, if you faithfully apply the gospel teaching, it results in a gospel life. But the inverse is also true. That gospel living reveals gospel truth. You can look at someone's life and know whether or not they're faithfully applying the gospel to their decisions. And eventually, if they're not, their life just becomes this 
facade of holiness is the word that Paul uses to the church in Colossae. Void of the power of God. It's an empty shell. It only looks good on the outside. Do you have those friends? They're always gospel, 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 Jesus, Jesus, gospel, gospel. They're full of the talk. It's lip service. Because if you went home at bedtime tonight into their home, their kids hate their guts, their wife can't stand them, and everybody's afraid of him. I've got those friends that at the end of the day, there's no gospel truth involved in that man's decision making. And it is bearing itself out in a gospel-less environment. We're pretty messed up people. And the only thing that's going to straighten us out is faithfully applying the gospel. Now, in case you're incredibly uncomfortable now because I've told you that it's about works and you're like, ah, I'm so confused now. Is this about works or faith? Because I thought that it was only about faith and we're just we're trusting and trusting and trusting and believing and believing. And works, that's something that, you know, that's legalism, Ben. We're not legalistic around here. That'd be the independent crew on the other side of town, right? Like we start talking funny things about our neighbors. One of the most helpful quotes that I've ever heard in this conversation is by Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard says, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Do you know what this tension sounds like in our culture? Bible Belt Christians, you ready for this? I'm going to offend you intentionally. Are, are you with me? On the one hand, if it is to be, it's up to me. I tell you how many times I've heard that? If it is to be, it's up to me. You know what that is, right? Self-centeredness. That's essentially saying, I can't trust any of you morons. I'm the only one who's trustworthy. And so if anything's going to happen around here, it's going to be because I did it. If it is to be, it's up to me. Pull myself up by my bootstraps and go get it done. Right? How about the other end of that spectrum? Well, if it's not about works and it's all about faith, then just let go. Let God. As though believing in Jesus is this effortlessness. If it is to be, it's up to me. And let go and let God are two lies from the pit of hell. Okay? I'm just setting the record straight this morning. Like, you can't... That is imbalanced. And if you put them together, it doesn't get better. Okay? Grace is not opposed to effort. You're actually going to have to do something when following Jesus. Not opposed to effort, but don't you ever think that it is about earning. Nothing you can do changes your Heavenly Father's mind about you. Nothing you do earns brownie points or extra credit with Him. It is all about what He has done that we are now faithfully doing. Okay, let me say it this way. Your Heavenly Father went to great Links acting on your behalf, embedded in the gospel, is action. He sent his only son, that's an action, to die a gruesome death on the cross in your place for your sin, that's an action. He was buried and on the third day rose from the dead, that's an action, so that you could inherit eternal life, that's an action. Your heavenly father has acted and made decisions towards you before you even knew he existed. And now there is a gospel expectation of you that if he has acted in that way toward you, that you ought to take the next right step. Do you think that being a follower of Jesus is just about being Sally Churchgoer and coming and sitting and dropping some cash in the bucket when it goes by and serving on the welcome team or the worship team or whatever Sunday school thing you teach, like that is not Christianity. And so if you're here and that's what you bought into, that's not the gospel. That's not gospel living. That's not gospel truth. The gospel demands that you do the next right thing. And the only way that you're ever going to know what the next right thing is, if you read it, You've got to be in it. You've got to saturate your mind and your heart with it because you can't be trusted. But this logic is trustworthy. You can build a life on it. 
That's what Paul's trying to tell Titus. That's what Titus is trying to teach the people on the island of Crete. And we're going to unpack the practicality of that over the next five weeks together. And I'm super excited about it. I can't wait. So to wrap up our time together this morning, um, I grew up in a, in a day and age when there were hymnals in the back of pews. I don't know if anybody in here remembers those days. You ever been to those churches? Um, not saying anything positive or negative about it. I love what we do, actually. The fog, the lights, it could be dialed up even a little more than the 6 p.m. service on Saturday for me, and I'm, I'm a happy camper. But I grew up in a church where there were hymnals in the back of the pews, and there are two hymns that come to mind from my upbringing that make this point really well. See if you know these. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how, do you know it? How I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. It's about me. Let's make much of me. It's such a self-centered hymn now that I think about it, right? What in the world? Like, why did we ever sing that? That's terrible. Listen to this one. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song will ever be. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is his love. I wonder, is life all about you? Are you living this self-centered reality where all of your decisions and all of your mess just reinforces how wonderful and awesome you are? Or have you come to the place where you realize there is a God in heaven who at great cost to himself acted on my behalf and he now wants me to take a step, to make a decision that's filtered through his perspective and his truth on reality because it's about his love for me. It's what he wants. If you live your life that way, your life will slowly become looking more and more like Jesus. If you can put that gospel into practice, it will slowly lead to a more stable life, even if everything in life is falling apart. Stability will be the theme of the day. In fact, I went from being someone untrustworthy who faithfully applied the gospel truth that I found, and I like to aspire to the idea that you can look at my life and find something worthwhile there. That over time, as I faithfully apply his love and the gospel to my life, I become a more trustworthy person. That's what we aspire to. That's what our leadership here, messed up as we are, aspires to. That you could follow us because we follow him. Gospel truth produces gospel living. Gospel living reveals gospel truth. Here's how Paul said it to another guy who was a peer of Titus. Titus, Timothy, Silas, all these guys traveled the Mediterranean world with Paul. And here's what Paul says to Timothy. Look familiar? This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. How's your self-perception today? Do you understand what he's done? And it's trustworthy, deserving of our full acceptance that if there's a list of worst sinners, my name is at the top. I can't be trusted, but even when I can't be trusted, this gospel can. So I just want to, I want to give you five minutes early today. Is that okay if we let you go early? Uh, no? You want more? I can keep going. And I just, I want to close our time a few minutes early by having you stand and actually want us to read this together. Again, where I grew up, we called this responsive reading, where we're reading back and forth to one another. And so I want to read 
the first two lines, and then I want you to recite with me the underlined part. I just want to do it twice. I want this to sink into your psyche this morning. This is what's true of you and me who follow Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The saying is trustworthy and deserves your full acceptance acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Heavenly Father, would you give us the wisdom from your word to know what the next right move is? Would you give us the strength by your spirit to take that step? Whatever it is that we know in our heart you're telling us needs to be the next right thing. Would you give us the strength and the courage to do that? And Father, as we go through these six weeks together in this series, would you take us into the letter that Paul sent to Titus? Would you drill it deep into our heads and our hearts? Not so that we can be perfect because we keep the rules, not because we want to know for certain where we go when we die, but because we want your filter for decision making in this life. It's our move. And we want to move in direction with you. Thank you so much for what you've done on our behalf. And we pray in the competent name of Jesus. Amen.